Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the uh, presentation on the California Way. And that does sound a little uh, unusual to say that in the, in the middle of Texas. But uh, we really appreciate your coming and giving up your lunch hour. Um, I want to assure you that the California Way is not a cult and that it's actually not a highway. What it is is an approach to education that emphasizes local control, equity, and perhaps most of all, collaboration. Today we have a distinguished group of, of educational leaders representing different aspects of education. And um, for example, we have uh, the uh, superintendent of public instruction, Tom Torlickson. I'll discuss more about him later. And we have uh, a California teacher of the year and a leader of one of the state's most innovative districts. That's Shannon Brown. Next, we have Todd Groves. He's a school board member from a high uh, poverty district. And uh, he's been in the trenches, both observing these dramatic changes and helping to implement them. And next, we have uh, Shelly Maser. And she is, has, she's a former school board member and has been a leader in the nonprofit sector. She's developed some innovative, great partnerships between the public and private sector that have allowed California to enact these changes. So let me introduce our first speaker, Tom Torlickson. He's the elected statewide leader of California schools. That means he oversees 6.2 million students, 1,000 school districts, and 10,000 schools. Now, Tom started his career as a science teacher and got very enticed by the profession. Then he uh, made his way into uh, politics. He served more than 16 years as an elected member of the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors. Then he moved to the legislature, where he became a leader in education policy. He served there for 14 years and helped uh, uh, start the, the whole system that um, we use to, to uh, fund school facilities. Overall, there were $45 billion in bonds approved by California voters. Um, Tom, Tom also served as a fireman in the Merchant Marines, and he earned the Vietnam Service Medal in 1969. But one of Tom's most relevant and uh, worthwhile experiences was being a cross country and track coach for 22 years. During that time, his teams won 12 championships. During that time, he also learned how to lead a team and the importance of teamwork in any endeavor, especially education. So I'll let uh, Tom take over. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. Thank you, Bill, for the kind introduction. The mic is on, and how are you? Are you guys on, minds open, hands on, ready to go? I am not going to sing the country and western song some of you mentioned as I came in that you might want to show again. That's on YouTube. Uh, that's a, di a different story. I'm here really to share some experiences we've had, which are not totally unique, but we combine them, I think, in a unique way, which we call the California way. So uh, delighted to be here. Um, I was told by your event sponsors and by Bill that this is a high energy conference, so I had to get my energy up, so I combined it with running three miles, getting endorphins and four cups of coffee, getting the caffeine, so I think my energy is pretty close to up to matching yours. But thank you for being here and thank you for being educators. Thank you for your, your dreams for kids to realize their maximum potential. So it's a great honor to me to be here with this group. We've been invited to share some of that work that we've done. What exactly do we mean by the California way? We use it to describe our journey to upgrade our entire education system to better serve the needs of all of our students, our parents, our businesses, and our economy by preparing students for 21st century careers in college. All of us are doing that in different ways across this country. The California way means enacting groundbreaking changes in education, doing it together with teamwork, with collaboration, consensus, and broad support. We're changing what students learn as we're doing across the country. 
but how students are funded and how schools and districts are evaluated is new territory. We're revamping the old system, leaving it behind, and putting forward a new, more progressive system. We've been moving from a system of test and punish to a system of support and continual improvement, a capacity building, working with Michael Fuller and working with Linda Darling Hammond from Stanford, Mike Kurz from Stanford, looking at capacity building and investing in our teachers and our classified and our administrative workforce in California, and using data to help us identify where students and schools need the most help. A hallmark of the California way, consensus building and strong relationships and collaboration. To strengthen relationships between schools and organized labor, we've launched a major labor management initiative, which Shannon will speak to in some detail, but it's galvanized school board members to come to meetings with the union leaders, with the classified leaders, and really sit down and talk about relationships and how to, how to work to win-win. And so it's some innovative work in that arena and overwhelmingly positive support and positive uh, interest in the, the workshops we have done. My own passion for education began, as was alluded to by Bill, when I was a science teacher and coach back in the early 70s. And I love to see the excitement of our students yearning for learning, the aha moments. Uh, and I emphasized all through my career, especially as a teacher and coach, teamwork, and you know how to spell team, T-E-A-M, and it stands for what? Together, everyone accomplishes more. And so we really built this team effort into the California way. We're a blue state, and Democrats hold all statewide office. But let me be clear, de Democrats don't always agree on education policy. Uh, and I have a track record of working in the legislature for those years, 14 years. Uh, I was in nonpartisan office for 30 years, and in the legislature went across the aisle to forge friendships and bonds and common ground to work with Republicans. So that's been something that we've done, uh, is not make it a partisan football, the changes that we're going through, the Common Core and some of the other reforms nationwide. We wanted it to be something that really focuses on the children and their potential and how to support them best. I was elected at the same time as Governor Jerry Brown, and just to share a story that's somewhat unique, uh, right after his election, he took the unusual step of walking from the Capitol unannounced. I don't even think his bodyguard detail security knew that he was leaving. And he came across the Capitol grounds from the state Capitol in his office to come to the Department of Education. He sat down to his friend Mike Kirst, who the governor of California you know, appoints all the State Board of Education. Mike Kirst is his appointee and president of the State Board of Education. I was sitting at the DS as well. And the governor just launched into a 15-minute passionate philosophical discussion of what education really means and how do we really tap into the individual potential of every single child in, this, in the great state of California. So it was one of those, those moments that um, we saw the governor saying also, I'm doing away with the secretary of education, which was a duplicative position in California, and said, I'm going to be more involved directly in education reform, and I trust the school board and the superintendent, uh, me, to work together to achieve the goals we had set out. So I realized then how closely our philosophies aligned. This broad agreement among the policymakers in California became the foundation for the California way. The adversity we all went through, educators and supporters, what we faced, what we faced around the country, recession brought us even closer for that team building. In 2011, we were in the midst of the draconian cuts that affected budgets across the states, across the districts in this country. We lost 30% of our teachers in terms of uh, losing 30,000 teaching positions and 20,000 classified positions. So we, we were reeling from those cutbacks and seeing programs collapse. I declared a state of financial emergency to shine the light on the dire need to stop the budget cuts and find more revenue. And we put a spotlight on the good things that were happening dis despite the cuts and had conferences and tours of schools, we set up a, a program where we said strong economy, strong schools together, and went around the state and promoted that. And so we worked closely with business partners that, that led to a campaign, a coalition among teachers, administrators, parents, and school board members. And at that same time, we pulled 50 experts together to create a blueprint for great schools. 
Mohammad Chaudhry is here today, one of the members of that effort. Linda Darling Hammond co-chaired that, that effort. We had business groups like the San Francisco Bay Area Council, uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership. We had uh, all across the state, the Los Angeles Chamber, one of the biggest uh, chambers of commerce in the United States. David Rattray was an active member. And so we shaped a plan, a blueprint, an action plan, and went out to the public and said, this is what you're buying into. We went to the voters and said, would you support a tax increase to invest in our schools, to invest in our students, to invest in our economy. And lo and behold, they said yes. Eight billion dollars more a year. An incredible amount of money, a rescue revenue that we had that st stemmed the tide of the cuts and moved us to a more positive position. The next year, California enacted a plan led by the governor and the state board and myself supporting it strongly and shaping that plan. It's called the Local Control Funding Formula. It's the biggest change in California in, uh, in terms of funding for the past 35 years, and it has two simple ideas. First, that parents, teachers, and school board members know best how to spend education dollars. One size does not fit all, top down does not work. Second, students facing the most challenges from those of low-income families and coming from poverty, English learners, and foster youth should receive more funds. And at the same time, we were altering our funding system California, like states across the country, were implementing Common Core. I early on urged us not to use the term Common Core in California. Just, we called it California Standards. And it took away from the controversy uh, around that was erupting around the country. And it was more accurate because the new standards really included not just math and English language arts, but English language development standards, uh, coming forward with STEM, coming forward with social sciences. We knew these new additional standards, but because we, sold it together, the business community, neighborhood leaders, and educators. Uh, I think we convinced the public that this is good for California, it's good for our students, it's good for their future, for the economy of the state. So we steered away from some of the controversy of the rest of the state. We were helped also the teacher unions in California, trained 160 teachers to become lead teachers and go around the state and share the values of the Common Core. And then the legislature responded to my call uh, for an investment of a billion and a half dollars into implementing the new standards. So we had money for professional development, the capacity building, we had money for internet connectivity and internet connecting devices, and the bandwidth we needed, and we moved, we moved forward. We had an initiative that I started four years ago called No Child Left Offline, and we invested and we closed the, the gap. In fact, we took the new assessment, Smarter Balance, last year, and guess how many out of 3.2 million students Guess how many had to take it paper and pencil because they were not able to connect to the internet to take the computer adaptive tests? It's a small number, 900. So 900 out of 3.2 million. And we had a very, very smooth uh, implementation of that new uh, testing. We were threatened the year before by the federal government to lose all of our Title I money if we didn't do the old paper pencil, the old CSTs, and then uh, we, they want us to do the pilot test for the new Smarter Balance. We stopped the testing the old way, took the money, saved it, and I know school board members around the state, I see Madeline shaking her head, uh, were grateful that they didn't have to do the old testing and the new testing at the same time. We used the money we saved to scale up a pilot test for about 500,000 students to all three million students. So almost all of our students had a practice before the real test this last spring. So we're moving forward on many fronts. One last area I think that is very much a part of the California way. is It's part of the new standards around the country. We're, we're implementing those, but it's to connect our learning to other subject matters, intersecting the learning, and connecting it to the real world, making it relevant, making it relevant to where a student sees him or her going in their direction, their dreams for their career. So we're, we've invested over the last five years $1.5 billion in career technical education. Over 3,000 businesses have stepped up to offer to be mentors, to, to set up internships. So it's, it's coming along quite well. Now I'll use a track metaphor and, and wind up, and you have a chance to hear from the rest of our good panelists. Track metaphor is we're halfway through a marathon. And it's a long, long run. And it takes a lot of energy, and it does, uh, cross country is also a team sport, it does take teamwork. And we do have many hurdles to overcome along the way. But we're, 
very pleased that we were able to pull together the kind of new framework for student success. Uh, we, of course, a state similar to Texas and other big states with large Latino populations. Uh, we have a quarter of our students are English learners, and more than half qualify for free and reduced lunch. These are big challenges, but we also see them as big opportunities. So we're really moving forward. And finally, we want to make a challenge here today. We do have an invitation to the technology world that we would like to see uh, the development of an app so that we can have our local control plans accessed more easily by parents and teachers and community and business leaders. So our vibrant technology community, we believe, uh, can step up. And we urge them to step up and work with us to create an app so that users can more readily see what the plans are for each school district, whether they're making their goals, what the outcomes are of their cooperative planning process. So I'm very pleased to be with you and most pleased at this moment to introduce a superstar, uh, a teacher of the year a few years back, and the union leader for uh, the California Teachers Association, and just an incredible educator, a teacher leader. And Shannon Brown, would you come and tell more of the California way? Thanks. All right, good, good morning. Am I on? Okay. All right, try it again. It's still morning. No, good afternoon. It's morning in California, so. So um, I appreciate your comments. I'm going to give you a slightly different frame and take it down to a district and teacher level perspective on what we've been doing in California. So. Many people can describe what they think would be a rich learning environment for students in the classroom. But where most approaches fall short is they don't look at the rest of the system in the district and at the state level to see how we're going to actualize that kind of environment in the classroom. And one of the things that I so appreciate what our state superintendent and our governor have done is they have looked at a systems approach. So my comments are going to go through three lenses. How the systems approach is focused on building capacity, creating a culture of we, and providing the resources for us to be able to do the work. So as the superintendent um, mentioned, in California, we have not had a tremendous backlash on our new state standards. Huge credit goes to the approach that the superintendent and the governor took, which was to pause the accountability system in California. The reason that was so important is we had to have an acknowledgement from our state leaders that we as teachers were going to go through a learning process as well. Linda Darling Hammond has said, it'll take us at least three to five years to be able to get to full implementation of the Common Core Standards. So as teachers, having the accountability system paused allowed us to embrace them and to risk learning ourselves learning the new standards, learning the new instructional strategies that were going to help our students be successful with the standards, and to learn new curriculum. This was also, uh, teachers also met this with excitement because of the depth of the standards, but also as the superintendent mentioned, the ability for us to have cross-curriculum collaboration, critically important for us to be successful. And while things are on their way going well in the standards, there are a couple of things that teachers are watching very closely. First of all, we have a generation of teachers who grew up under NCLB professionally. So the shift for them of the bite-sized information that students are supposed to ingest to the deep learning has caused our professionals to um, increase their learning as well. Some districts still do not have all of the materials in place. Textbooks are coming along, but the early adopters are realizing they did not capture the depth and breadth of the standards. And quite honestly, while California is doing, uh, designing a new accountability system, which we know will be a vast improvement over the old system, people are still holding their breath saying, this is a nice time right now, but what's coming next? Building the culture of we. So another uh, focus in California has been on the labor management uh, initiative, which has been all of the state organizations coming together to say we support working together. Because in the end, we cannot do it without each other. Our students need us to work together to provide the best system possible for them. What does that look like? 
Well, in San Juan, back at home, that's my district, we do a lot of things together, and I'm going to focus on two initiatives. We have redesigned our evaluation system, and we have done it jointly. It has not been controversial, except in the places that people don't know about it. We built our system on our successes of our currently existing peer assistance and review program. We have one of the best PAR programs in the country, so we already know what to do with struggling students. When we looked at our evaluation system, we realized that it did nothing for anyone else. So jointly, the district and the association sat down and said, we are going to design a system that rather than measuring people better, focuses on strengthening the core focus of quality teaching, which is reflecting on evidence to improve next steps and to support student learning. So what we say is, we think the wrong question to ask is, did students learn? The right question to ask is, as a teacher, what are you doing in response? Because if you talk to anyone who spent time in the classroom, we all have lessons that don't go well. But what quality teachers do is they know when something doesn't go well, they know who did and did not get it in the room, and they design next steps to make sure they get it the next time. That's the work that we're doing in San Juan. We're also working on another critical component, which is addressing social emotional needs for students. In San Juan, which has historically been a white suburban district, we have seen tremendous growth and poverty, unfortunately. We have also had a huge number of uh, refugees from the Middle East coming into our schools. We have to work together to figure out how to support kids, not just in quality instruction, but making sure whatever they're coming to school with, that we are finding ways to support them so that they can focus on academics. So by having the state take the lead in focusing on accountability, uh, excuse me, on focusing on capacity building and creating a culture of we, we feel like we are really moving forward to support the students in our district and in the state. So with that, I will pass it on to Todd Groves, local school board member, and one, quite frankly, I wish was in my district. Todd. Thank you. Uh, greetings, afternoon. Um, I get to talk about what it's like to be a first-term board member uh, during the most sweeping changes in public education in California in a, in a lifetime. Uh, had I known four years ago that it was not just the Common Core we were walking into, but a restructuring of our finance system and our accountability system, I might have thought twice about running. It's been a, a dynamic process and, and one that uh, I encourage the nation to look toward uh, as, as a way of transforming education broadly. We have a, a lot of pow power and potential in the California way. Um, uh, briefly about my district, it's the West Contra Costa Unified School District. It sits in the northeast corner of the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a, it's a dynamic and beautiful community of people from all around the world. It's uh, comprised of many of the, the, the students who are focused on in our local control accountability formulas. They are students who generate extra funding for our district by nature of them qualifying for a free or reduced lunch, of being an English language learner, or a foster youth. Uh, and they, we can't count them multiply in any category. So we, uh, our, our uh, community has about 75% of children who qualify under those criteria. Ethnically, we're around 50% Latino, a little over 20% African American, uh, and the rest is evenly split between white and Asian students. It's a, it's a community that's been historically uh, under the, the tenets of No Child Left Behind measurements underperforming and presents a, a large number of, of challenges in uh, trying to uh, move forward academically, but also to deal with uh, some of the consequences of communal violence, intergenerational poverty, and some of the things that generate trauma in our young people's lives. When, we, uh, when I first got on the board, we undertook a strategic plan that had us focus on whole child as a, as an as, as, as a way of addressing the entirety of our students' needs, as opposed to just focusing on the, class, the classroom uh, preparation. 
we uh, ended up uh, adopting a wide-ranging full-service community school model, which pushes social services, uh, family support services, even health care for the entire community into some of our schools. We've uh, partnered with organizations and industry to uh, provide um, dynamic new advanced manufacturing opportunities in our fab lab. We're one of the largest link learning districts in California, which means we're doing career technical education as our primary high school reform. Um, under the previous funding formula, I want to get to the local control funding formula because I do believe that is a, a national model. The previous funding formula, our funding came in very specified and highly regulated forms to us, and it was uh, very difficult to spend in a way that meaningfully moves students. Now that we have the local control funding formula, we as the board and the community uh, working together can assess our true needs, direct the funding according to our, our, our hypotheses of where the most good will be done, and then uh, measure, based on our own local measurements, whether we're making progress. This is an extraordinary opportunity I, 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 I implore the nation to look at. Um, the, the old funding formula would often leave us with a, a, a great deal of regulatory compliance and uh, huge administrative burden to make sure that we spent in a, in a compliant way. The, the accountability we feel right now as the board is, is to our community. When they ask what, you know, what services the, uh, are coming their way and when, and when can they get there, we're not, we're not looking to Sacramento to see whether we've checked all the boxes. We're looking to our neighborhoods to see whether uh, our students are making it to school on time or making it uh, outside of school or whether the families have access to health care or food. So we have a, 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 a new way of looking at, at what uh, school is supposed to do. We do believe schools are the new community centers. Uh, the flexibility has is, is given us a, a lot of room to experiment. and and especially with career technical education. We are linking with business partnerships all around the Bay Area and trying to uh, push uh, the uh, opportunity to gather professional experience that will allow our students to walk out and walk into a, a, a high paying, high demand job in the Bay Area immediately out of high school, work their way through college, either community or four year, or go on to a professional degree in an area of healthcare, law, law enforcement, IT, and technical uh, education, and uh, help me out. What's the last one, Madeline? Engineering. Engineering, yeah. So my colleague Madeline Cronenberg in the audience. So we have, so our students are walking out with, with uh, technical degrees, like cer uh, certified nurse assistants, so they're making money right out of high school. Uh, we've been a participant, an early participant in the labor part management initiative that uh, State Superintendent and Ms. Mazur put together through the CDE Foundation, and it's been a transformative experience. Our labor groups work with our superintendent and our HR uh, to heads to, to problem solve collectively in a way that previously uh, not really uh, happened and, and been relegated to negotiations group by group. So now we can sit there and address the problems holistically, and we can have peer uh, peers like San Juan Unified to teach us how they've uh, brought, got such great buy-in buy -in on, their, on their PARS program because uh, we, we, ha we believe that the labor organization's participation and partnership are, are going to be the, the engine that really drives transformative change. One of the, the, the challenges that we've had with, with the local control funding formula is that uh, Although we've received an additional accelerated $36 million, this is the first year we were back to the pre-crisis level of funding in our district. We are at the same level we were in 2007. So um, as we restore, we're restoring basic services like high school counseling and, and elementary music, stuff that we had to take away regretfully during the, the, the post-bubble years. And so some of the really exciting opportunities that the LCFF presents will have to wait until we restore uh, the rudiments of the, the whole the basic system. But with that, and, and particularly with this audience, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited by the opportunity 
to, to implement design thinking at a system-wide level and take a great stock of what we're actually trying to do as a, as a school system and then applying a design lens to, the, uh, to the, the, the funding formula that we have and applying uh, measures to see what, uh, local measures to see if we're making progress. And uh, if we're, we, like uh, the state superintendent was, was hinting, we could absolutely use partnership with analytics firms, uh, new ways of thinking to help us as a system-wide uh, public entity to, to get into a design thinking frame. But with that, uh, I mean, it's a great time to be in California. Uh, I, if you want to run for school board, come talk to Shelly and or me, and I'll give you some idea of what it's like. She I, I like to introduce my uh, mentor here, Shelly Mazur, who was on the school board Redwood City when I first came on my, the board and gave me stellar advice on, on how to govern. Um, she is a leader now of a, a nonprofit sector developing initiative public private partnerships to implement the sweeping changes we have going on in California with great success, might I add. And uh, I still, uh, I, I, wanna, I definitely want to work for CDE Foundation someday, Shelley, so. <laughs> oh, good to know, Todd. Thank you. <laughs> so I think you can see why things are going well in California. We have such great leaders at all levels of the system. So huge thanks to our state superintendent for his commitment to collaboration. Um, it's making such a huge difference. And to the collaboration that we have at the local level, um, it's been a hallmark, I think, of the superintendent's term collaboration. It started with the blueprint that he mentioned, and it continued when he and his close advisors formed the CDE Foundation, which, as Todd said, I'm fortunate to lead. So I, had, I was having a little bit of a like whiplash, sort of like PTSD from all of the bad times in California that um, the superintendent talked about, but I'm happy that we're here now talking about what's positive, and I think what's positive in California are also positive things that can be looked at and worked on in the rest of the country. So thanks for being here and, um, and uh, just hearing a little bit about what we're doing. Just quickly, CDE Foundation partners with the California Department of Education to collaboratively support programs that impact changes in uh, state standards, in STEM education, student health and wellness, and as you've heard, labor management collaboration. In California, we educate one in eight kids in this country. And in a state this size with the needs um, so great, it requires everyone to work together to make our public education system strong. The government can't be responsible for all of this on its own, and as you've heard, we've changed our funding system, our standards, we've changed our assessments, and we're working on a new accountability system. That's a lot of change and a lot of work to be done together. So CDE Foundation, to support this remodeling of our public education system, has taken the approach of bringing together state education leaders to tackle these issues together. So you've heard a couple of things mentioned that CDE Foundation has played a role in, and I'll just talk about a, a few of them just to give you a sense of how we're working together and what might be possible for you in your states if you're not in California. How many people here are from California? Oh my gosh. All right, well, so then get involved. I'm gonna tell you about it, and then you guys have to come and join us, get involved with what we're doing. Um, so one of them is on Common Core, and hopefully some of you are familiar with the work that happened around our Common Core communications. Um, we recognized two critical needs. One was support for communications, and two was really actually just keeping everyone together and agreeing that this was the kind of work we needed to be doing in California. Um, for CDE Foundation, we're very grateful to our funders, including the Gates Foundation, which was a major funder that made this work possible in California. So we brought together our Administrators Association, our PTA, our School Boards Association, um, our County Superintendents Association, the, the State Board, the Department, um, the, the Chambers, and we harnessed the power of 1.2 million members of these associations to communicate about our new standards. I'm just gonna give you a little quote because I think this is really what it's all about. Um, we did a little evaluation and uh, one of our um, participants said, getting us all to the table, talking about how we want to frame the messages and build understanding or what's happening. Having that ongoing conversation, helping put those materials together is probably the campaign's biggest accomplishment. So it was more than just actually having stuff that people could communicate about but it was about how are we all gonna work together and it set the stage for some of these other initiatives that you've heard about. The same partners are involved with our labor management initiative and we believe that's fundamental to all of the changes that are happening in California. The adults have to work together if we're gonna be successful. 
Um, so with the Labor Management Initiative, we're excited to be able to say we're impacting the education of over one and a half million students in over 100 districts um, across the state. We did our first convening last May. We were um, wondering, would we have 25 districts who wanted to come and join us? And by the time we closed registration, we had a little over 100. We didn't quite have room for everybody, so we've done some follow-up work to um, make it possible for more districts to get involved, and that's brought us up to about 100. We're also going to be working now, we've recently surveyed districts to understand what do they want to learn about more, how do they, what kinds of topics do they want to tackle together collaboratively, and so we'll be doing some follow-up work with all of those districts who participated first to address some of the topics that you've heard talked about today. Um, the um, implementation of standards, our new local control accountability plans, those kinds of things. How do the adults work together to make those be successful in the local districts? Those same partners also are sitting on the superintendent's advisory task force on accountability and continuous improvement. It's always a long name, um, but, uh, but we think it's really important to have all of those partners sitting at the table and others to help advise a superintendent on some recommendations around our new state accountability system. We also, at CDE Foundation, have been fortunate to support the implementation of the California um, Next Generation Science Standards and have similar partners as well as others sitting at the table with us to talk about that. One of the things that's unique about us is we sit in a neutral convener role. People come to our table as equals. And I think that's made a huge difference that there's not sort of one um, big uh, organization that is in charge and then everybody else sort of follows their lead. We all come to the table, have discussions, make decisions together, and then um, go out with what we can agree on. We've also been able to bring private money to bear on some public issues that has supported these coalitions, but it's also helped catalyze some changes at the state level. I'll just give you one quick example. Um, through private dollars, we were able to support some smarter balanced assessment fellows who were able to work with districts across the state as they started to implement the new smarter balanced assessments, provide technical assistance, come back, talk about the challenges, share that with the department, and make, so the department could then make changes in response to what was happening in the districts. And we heard the result, um, only 900 kids taking the um, test um, by paper and pencil, and we've had super positive feedback from that. What that's resulted in is in the department being able to make a request to the legislature to support these fellows on an ongoing basis who can then go out and work with districts. So our guiding principle at CDE Foundation is keeping the students at the center of all of our work. And I think that's the guiding principle of everyone sitting here on this stage. We all think about every day, what are we doing to make it possible for kids to be successful in their schools and in their school systems? And by working together, we think, we think we'll continue successfully along the California way. Bill? We turn it back over to questions now? Yes, sure. Questions from all of you. So many from California. What other states do we have here besides California? Shout it out. Massachusetts? Massachusetts has labor management. Well, good to, good to hear you. Any questions you would like to ask any of the panelists? I think I got the mic, so I'll go first. Hi, sure. my name is Steve Wright. I'm with the, uh, very proud to be with the California Community College uh, system. I, I work in the Doing What Matters program to help align uh, curriculum and information communications technology with business. And uh, the question I have is one of policy. Uh, a lot of the students we get from the high schools have a choice to make when they get to community college. Do I want to pursue, pursue transfer model curriculum and, and uh, follow a, a relatively narrow path and try to get to a CSU? Or do I want to look at CTE, career technical education, and take a lot of courses that, that don't transfer? And I may get a jump start on a career, but later on, year two, three, they don't transfer to a CSU. And I, you may know or not that we've done a lot of work getting our model curriculum for information technology IT acceptable to the CSUs, but they say they don't have the next two years. We'd like to offer a Bachelor of Applied Science in the, as a four-year thing at the community colleges, but the CSUs say that's competitive. So we, we end up being in kind of a policy conundrum here. And the vast number of students I see coming out of the inner cities who like cyber patriots, like IT, I think we can do a wonderful job with a Bachelor of Applied Science. And so my question to you is, from a policy perspective, 
Which is the preferred way to go, the transfer model curriculum or the Bachelor of Applied Science? I think it's both, and I'll ask other panelists if they wish to add to it. Um, I'm responsible for preschool, childcare, on up through the 12th grade. I'm a regent in the CS, regent in the UC system and a CSU trustee. Technically, there's no role for the superintendent in community colleges, but we work well with the community colleges, and we're seeing them step up in a really meaningful way. Of the 500 million we did last year out to communities, we did $15 million grants and $10 million grants for getting employers to sit down with the community college, with the high school instructors, uh, the CSUs, and, and really listen to each other and create these career pathways. So around the state, uh, community colleges have really stepped up. And our goal is to have students prepared either to go on and get their BS or their BA degree to go forward in some way to you know, get that uh, you know, college degree, or to be prepared to go right into the workforce. There's a lot of certification programs there, whether it's phlebotomy and, and x-ray and, uh, you know, medical systems, whether it's fire service. There's a number of areas where students can get uh, competency cer certificates that are uh, certifications that are portable. So I see our goal in, in the K-12 system is to prepare students so they can decide whether they want to go into the building trades, for instance. We created an apprenticeship program in high school where students in their senior year can do the coursework and get one year under their apprenticeship, and then they can go on to a regular apprenticeship program. One thing that may also address your concern a bit, uh, we're really, I'm really promoting and we're, as a state, promoting dual enrollment. So I visit schools like Wadati uh, High School, which is in the Sierra Community College campus. It's on campus. I met a young lady who was getting her medical assistance uh, uh, AA uh, and a chemistry AA as she graduated from high school. So she had two AAs. You go around the state and you see these programs where in the senior year, students are fully engaged on their career pathway. They may change later, but they're learning all the soft skills, all the basic critical thinking, problem solving. And think about the affordability issue. They're completing half their college education while they're still in high school. They're into the workforce faster, and they have far less debt. So I'm, I'm seeing us need to, to prepare students to be able to choose which direction, whether they continue. Many students will choose to uh, go into the workforce soon, and they, get, they have the skills to go in and make really good money right away. But they will come back and, and get a business management degree or get a higher level of degree at some point in their career. So I see it also as a continuum of learning. Any further thoughts on that one? I, I you do, do a lot of career tech ed in West Contra Costa. Absolutely. So uh, one, one category. Bring the mic up. I do like the, I do like the idea of, of the applied science bachelor's degree, but I, I'd also like to think about us extending the baccalaureate programs at community college to expand the number of baccalaureates available, a four-year degree at the community college level, which makes it extraordinarily affordable, and especially if it's in the CTE field, uh, students are walking out with a, with a bachelor's, they could do the applied science. I'm not sure if we can do applied science right now with the current baccalaureates, but uh, I, I think that that's definitely a model we, we should expand. One last footnote. Do we have a teacher shortage or what? We have a very serious shortage across the country. It's severe in California, and not just in special needs kids, services, or math and science, but in career ed and art and many, many other subjects. So one of the neat things that San Bernardino City District is doing in, in California uh, and several other districts I visited, they have a three-year program to become a teacher. And they're learning about being, becoming a teacher while they're in high school. They actually go to middle school and elementary school, read to kids, be, prepare lessons. So that they're moving forward. And what we're looking at this year legislatively is to say, why shouldn't teachers be able to start their teaching training while they're a junior and senior in college? So you get the high school then they come on to college, and then instead of having to wait a fifth year to do their teacher training, they can graduate with their BS and BA degree and have a teaching credential and go straight to work. So that's another model we're looking at implementing. Other questions? Yes, yes ma'am in the center. And then the gentleman behind. Uh, Superintendent, you uh, uh, talked about that we want in California are moving from test and punish to support. And I wanted to ask you, how are we changing, or what are the opportunities in California in assessment, uh, especially in regards to the new ESSA 
uh, that was passed by President Obama? Is, is California doing something in, or being more flexible in how we're assessing students in schools or are there discussions on uh, how we're going to implement uh, personalized learning and project-based learning methodologies? I couldn't quite hear the full question, but I'm going to also ask Shannon if she wants to respond. But basically, we, we want to assess and really look at data carefully right down to the subgroups. We embrace that. Uh, we do believe that ESSA's got it right. It's sort of the California way, local control, state control. But schools have their own and districts have their own assessment tools in addition to the Smarter Balance statewide assessment. We're looking forward to the implementation next year. We'll have data from the next you know, uh, promotion, deployment of the Smarter Balance. We'll be able to compare that to the benchmark base you know, scores that we got this year. Uh, but we're looking at a multifaceted measure of accountability, not just the test scores, but also attendance, graduation rates, uh, college or career readiness, how students are ready for many different aspects. So I would just add, I think um, the, the State Board President has talked a lot about, and I think the superintendent as well has talked a lot about a dashboard um, for our account, new accountability system. So the task force that I mentioned just a minute ago is in the process of making a set of recommendations to the superintendent. But I think to your question, which was in part about personalized learning and um, project-based learning, as we think about expanding the measures that uh, we look at and we think about how we're going to not just look at things at a point in time, but how do we look at growth and how do we um, continuously improve how we serve our students and how we make it possible for them to be successful. This new um, new way of looking at accountability, I think very much supports that kind of approach that looks at many dimensions of student learning and many dimensions of how we support students to be successful. Does that answer your question? Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. And if you are from other than California, tell us where. Oh, no, I'm from Sacramento, California, your backyard. So. All right, you're close by. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my name is Ramel Antoine, and I get to work for Road Trip Nation, and we get to help create experiences for young people to help them uh, get connected to their interests and connect those interests to a career. Um, and going back to the idea of providing resources for educators to do the work, which I thought was really well framed, I'm trying to under we're trying to understand what where the gaps might be or opportunities for more collaboration. Um, between the workforce and schools, not just you know the pathways and CTE, but uh, going down to the classroom level, what kinds of gaps are there for teachers um, in terms of having them do that work of helping get students energized, motivated, connected to what they'd want to be doing long term? And that's an excellent question, and there are some programs that exist that are rich and deep in that that area without being part of the official career pathways or the California partnership uh, schools or academies. Uh, and I think we need to do more of that. That's the, the new standards actually call on, on us to connect our learning, what's being taught in the classroom and what students are learning to the real world, to their, their idea of their future, what they're dreaming about in terms of what they want to become and what skills they want to have. So I, I think we need to explore that question deeper. I know I visited uh, schools in Santa Ana where uh, the local business community and Chamber of Commerce have adopted that school. They have guest speakers. They take students to, you know, CPA offices and understand accounting as a career. Uh, they take them to real estate. They take them to the public works department of the city. They, they, they basically expose the students to different career opportunities and how they can apply the math they're learning or the science they're learning or the writing skills they're developing and talking skills they're developing how they can apply them to real jobs in the real world. I'd like to ask if um, you have some further thinking about that, our panel. Sure, so from a teacher perspective, what I'll say is, uh, if our accountability system continues to move in the direction that we think it will, which is looking at multiple measures of student success, teachers are building those connections as we speak. Um, you know, I talked to a colleague um, just on Friday about she's a second grade teacher and what all of uh, second grade is doing is uh, talking about recycling. So they're having kids bring in different items and they're having to first repurpose them. So they're using creativity and they have to work in teams. The second thing they're doing is they're then taking them to a recycling center and figuring out what does recycle. And then they're also going to do... Um, 
research on what kinds of things uh, that make it to the landfill, how long they take. So they're trying to get kids into the realities of the world around them, uh, and this is for a second grade classroom. So the connections you're talking about, people are designing right now, if we can hold the system steady so that people can stay focused on that meaningful type of learning and that we don't bounce back to where we were, which is looking at test, test scores, which is why the work in California is so important um, that we are trying to make sure we're looking at multiple measures. Anybody else? Yes. I see a hand up over there. We have bright light shining at us, so it's hard for us to see all of you, but... Uh, Hi, I um, I'm really interested in this conversation about uh, both measurement and real-world connections for students and this sort of thing, and I know that West Contra Costa County just got a, a fab lab in one of their high schools, and that they're using that to, not just for the high school, but for other grade levels around um, the area, which I think is amazing. And I'm just, um, I know it only just opened, I guess, in September, but I'm interested to, to hear sort of how that's going and if some of these questions about other ways of assessing learning and the process um, and connecting kids to real, real world problems and sort of how that's um, manifesting in the Fab Lab, if you know. Do you care to respond? School board member, Todd. Uh, yeah. well, <laughs> so uh, this is a, a new direction for us, of course. Uh, it's, it's novel territory. The Fab Lab is up and running. Students are in there everywhere from elementary through high school and uh, learning a lot about uh, prototyping and, and creating. Um, we're developing the community access piece. We want to model it after hacker spaces that are all, uh, you know, widely dispersed around the Bay Area, but uh, generally have a low liability footprint. Whereas uh, we, we haven't, we're, we're still working on some of the business side to be able to make it a community asset. Um, and uh, just to piggyback on what we talked about earlier, we're emphasizing a lot of uh, teacher externship opportunities to make sure that our teaching force, especially those in our link learning programs, are garnering relevant work experiences in a contemporary uh, business environment so that they can bring that back and implement new protocols within our classrooms that better mirror the, the current conditions in industry. Um, and our, our measurements uh, are right now have been largely around satisfaction. You know, are our families satisfied with their our offerings? Are our teachers satisfied with their professional development offerings? We're really focusing on customer satisfaction as a primary driver. Um, I mean, for, if we do, I think the community will hold us accountable on the summative te annual t summative test scores. That's the measure they've had for 20 years. I don't imagine that that's going to shift anytime soon. Um, I'm not I'm not uh, as, as uh, concerned about that. I think we'll be making progress. But I do think once the broader and more uh, rich measures are, are more widely known, I think people are going to start to look at those and rethink what they, they see in accountability. Great. So I, um, I think you got an answer to your question, right? I just have two things because we're almost at a time that I didn't mention that I really do want to mention. One is um, for all of you from California and from across the country who are interested in um, STEM education, in partnership with the California Department of Education, the CDE Foundation does host an annual STEM symposium. It was the superintendent's brainchild a few years ago. We're starting our, it'll be our fourth this year. Last year we had 3,100 people. So come and join us. We have a lot of fun and a lot of great learning. We'll be in Anaheim in October, and we'd love to see all of you there. And then I just want to reiterate the challenge that the superintendent issued around our local control accountability plans. What we're asking is the tech field to step up and help us think about like, what's the turbo tax kind of piece around our local control accountability plans. How do you take the complexity of that put it into a system that helps you figure out the different pieces and then builds out a plan for, dis for districts and um, schools that makes sense to the community and um, helps planning for the future. So that's our challenge, and I'm so glad Mohammed's here. We're, we're going to ask the tech community, not only in Silicon Valley, but uh, you know, Silicon Beach and all around the state to step up, and all around the country really to step up and help us develop a, a cool app that will uh, make the complex more easy to navigate and, and simple and effective. 
simultaneously, we've created something called the California Collaborative for Education Excellence, funded it with a seed fund of $10 million. And they're going to be collecting best practices. They're going to be going to schools that want a fantastic PAR program. They'll pay for Shannon to be released for two weeks to go over and train another school on how to get the PAR program up and going. If it's a cool STEM program, a really effective English learner program, uh, we're going to be borrowing from other districts and giving release time for teachers and paying the, 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 the base school district for the substitutes. And so that's, we're collecting best practices. We have um, our digital chalkboard uh, is a, a place that we're wanting to modernize and get less clunky and more up to speed. But we are looking at how do we share the wealth of talent and experience that we have already in the teacher workforce in the state and, and harness it and, and share it. And so the challenge is on, right, for our tech on. community friends out here and others who will be watching in, uh, listening in. We, we need your help. Any other questions? I know we're running the clock down to the time when people need to get on to the next fun and a good experience. Thank you all for being here and sharing the California way. Thank you for being educators and caring about our students.